Mountaintop moments. If you had to list some in your life, what are the, what are the typical characters, right? Mountaintop. Anybody climb Mount Bora here? Have you done that? I think I have missed my window. <laughs> I, uh, I actually got asked a couple of times in my first couple of years here. And uh, one time I was all set to go and it just, something came up. I wasn't able to do it. But I kind of regret that. I kind of regret that. Um, I, in my youth, I did some of that with uh, scouts, Boy Scouts. By the way, Scouts Sunday. Are, they, are any of them still here? Here we are. 32 years. Thank you for being part of our church. And we've got scouts here. We're grateful for that. So, and look, I can embarrass Robin. Will got his Eagle Scout. That was awesome. That was really cool. So I'm a New York City Eagle Scout, which seems like an incongruity. Um, but it was, uh, but, but in, in trips we made, you know, um, to New Mexico and so forth, um, climbing peaks over 11,000, you know, that was a thing. That was work, man. And uh, I don't know that I would call it my favorite thing. Um, but the view is spectacular. The view is spectacular. And I'm hoping that today you kind of, we get a view here today. Jesus takes him up a mountain. Why? Um, if we have all kinds of mountaintop things, we can name them, right? I mean, things like holding your baby, you know, holding that baby. That's a mountaintop moment for me. Um, getting married, that was a mountaintop moment for me. Um, graduating, getting a degree. Maybe you got special honors with it, getting that first job that you really wanted, you accomplished a goal. You know, maybe it's, you got a scholarship or maybe you won a, a basketball tournament or, you know, in a, in a sport or something. Maybe you got the high school, maybe you won the lottery. I don't know. Mountaintop moments, right? The thing that's interesting and the reason I share those, we can all, and we should rejoice in those, shouldn't we? To stop in our minds and say, Lord, thank you for those mountaintop moments for bringing us up to the top of the mountain and, and having a celebration. But to be honest, I think especially like of a mountaintop moment like getting married or holding a baby or getting a degree, that it's really key is the next question. Now what? Right? You get to the mountain, now what? And I, I didn't say this at the first service. I'm fascinated too by the, by the idea of mountains. What is that book? From Sea to Shining Sea. And it's the Lewis and Clark expedition. And it's interesting, when they come to the mountains, that is not what we would call a mountaintop experience. Because they get to the mountains and it's like, holy cow. Right? They see range after range after range of mountains like they have never seen in their life. I mean, the bumps in the Appalachians don't compare to that range of Rocky Mountains that they saw, low, low pass, and oh my goodness. So when they saw those mountains, that was not an exultant celebration. A lot of us are journeying in mountains, and I'm going to be very honest with you, and some of you, if you're guests, please forgive me. We're in a little bit of a personal time here, and not everyone is welcome in because we love your prayers, but we're doing a memorial service. It's a hard one tomorrow. So for Tara Letzring, we're going to celebrate the gift of her life, but it's a hard one. And I, that was on my mind in preparing this. That's Psalm 30, Elaine, that you read. So good. So good. And uh, we're going to look at Psalm 77 tomorrow in this funeral. It's going to be honest. It's hard. It's hard. Um, so I want to talk about mountaintop moments, why they matter. Because we have moments like tomorrow. So we need those. And what are the things that God is, because when we say, now what? Right? I got to the mountain, now what? That's what these four points are trying to say. So uh, walk with me, if you will, here for a minute. Because I think a lot of us, if, if, if we don't admit it, all of us certainly are still climbing. We're still in that journey. And sometimes it's, Sometimes it's tough. So here's the first thing. Um, the first thing I want you... Oh, here. i got to say this first of all. Theologically, from this passage we have today, the reason it's a big service in our church year, um, Transfiguration, this is the one in which for the disciples, up to this point, Jesus has cast out demons, he's done miracles, he's healed the sick, right? Spoken with authority. They're like in awe and amazed. 
But there's still probably some debate among the disciples. Who is this guy really? Right? Who is this really? They get up to the mountaintop, Peter, James, and John. There's no more debate. I mean, there is no debate. It's like, whoa. Right? Here's Jesus is God in the flesh. And they now know beyond a shadow of a doubt that Jesus is not only willing, but able to accomplish the goal of salvation, which the Father set from the very fall into sin, this is how he's doing it. And this is, his, this is the one. So it's, theologically speaking, that's why transfiguration is so huge. Because it's in this moment in Jesus' ministry in which God pulls back the veil and you see who Jesus is, God in the flesh. So anyway, that's the theology. But let's talk about now what? So now they know. Now what? The first thing is this, God is higher than any mountain. So that plays two ways. If you have some mountaintop moments, like I love being married, I adore my wife. We're so blessed. God is higher than that. I love my kids. I sobbed and sobbed when I held them in my arms for the first time. God is higher than that. I've been on a mountain where I was unable to finish the hike because I got hurt and could not accomplish the goal. God is higher than that. I've been in situations of great disappointment, personal failing. God is higher than that. So point number one is this. God is higher than any mountain. And that's a word that Lewis and Clark needed to hear too. God is higher than any one of those mountains that you're going to face. And the second thing is this. So... um, So Teresa and I, and it's nice of you, some of you, Shane, it's nice. He says, you can't retire. Yeah, too bad, I'm doing it anyway. Uh, But thank you for your your sentiment. Um, But it's interesting, because when you think about it, people tell me a lot, well, you better plan for that. You know, that's not easy. You gotta plan for that. You gotta, you know, otherwise you'll go crazy or drive Teresa crazy or whatever, you know. Um, And I think, think, you know, and, and we're thinking about it, all that. Um, but it also happened, different stages in our life are different. Like, we're really thrilled. Sarah and David are, are on their own. They don't live in the house. Married. Luke runs around. David's got his own thing. He's got his own house. I mean, they're doing their thing. When that happened, that was a different phase for us. We became empty nesters. You have to get used to a new normal. Right? You retire. You've got to get used to a new normal. I think one of the points of this, Jesus taking him up there, is I need you to get used to a new normal. You think that you have to ascend to this mountain to get in the presence of God. You think that you have to make a sacrifice in the temple and obey the rules to get into the presence of God. You think that is not true, my friends, because the same one who brought you up the mountain is going to go back down with you. This is a big deal, you guys, how this has changed from the Old Testament and the New Testament. This is a big deal. Moses, God calls from the mountain, come up to me. This is completely different. And Jesus says, I'm down here, let's go up together. And I won't stay here, I'm going to come back down. This is a big deal. So whatever, if you get one thing out of this today, you can go nowhere where God can't be with you. You will never be in a place where God is not with you. You might even turn your back on him, he will never turn your back on you. There is no place that he will not be. And that's a powerful message here. Peter, James, and John, walk up the mountain with me, and I'm going to walk back down with you, and we're going to keep going. Why does that matter? Second point. God lifts us out of any depth repeatedly. Why? And here comes the psalm, and this is a powerful psalm. I will exalt you, O Lord, for you lifted me out of the depths and did not let my enemies gloat over me. O Lord, my God, I called to you for help, and you healed me. O Lord, you brought me up from the grave. You spared me from going down into the pit. We were in Hawaii. You know what the, you know what the people on Hawaii love to say? The highest mountain on earth is not Mount Everest, but it's Mauna Kea. But they count the whole part that's underwater. It seems like cheating. But whatever. You don't argue when you're in Hawaii. It's just like, okay. <laughs> Um, so 30, you know, it's like 33,000 feet is how they measure it. 
What I found interesting as I thought about that, I said, you know, even if you were 10,000 feet up, you'd still be under the water. And we're kind of in that journey. There are times when we're going along and God gives us great joy. But every once in a while, it still feels like we're underwater. But we're on the mountain. And we're journeying and we're journeying with others. Why does he do this? Why does God, because he just, because he knows we're not going to make it on our own. And you don't do it in fits and starts. He's going to have to lift you up repeatedly. He's going to have to pick you up. Repeat, he's going to have to carry you repeatedly. So he brings Peter, James, and John up there. So there's two interesting things to me. He brings Peter, James, and John, and then he tells them, don't tell anybody. Don't tell anybody until Easter. Now, Jesus, brilliant teacher. What a brilliant teacher. It won't make sense till then. Because you know what they'll try to do? You know what they'll try to do? Oh, he's God. Could you please lead our army to kick out the Romans? Could you please do that? Could we make you General Jesus? And there's a tendency of that in even our culture today. Let's make him general Jesus to go to battle for us. And he already has gone into battle and continues to do so every day. The most important battles you can face. And so why did you do that with Peter, James, and John? And I think it's key. These are kind of the leaders of the disciples. Jesus does this several times, takes those three. Because he wants them to teach the others. Why does God keep lifting us up? Why does he take us up to the mountain? Why does he pick us up when we fall? Because you see people fall and struggle and stumble around you all the time, don't you? And God is longing, longing for us to say, I fell too, come on. Let's walk together, come on. Let's walk together. And that can be hard. Like when you're hiking up a mountain, some people that are in great shape, and then you have guys like me, I'm shaped like a barrel. I don't go as fast. And the guys that are in great shape, they don't, it's hard for them when I hike with them. If we're trying to stay together and have a conversation. they got to slow down. I can't go that fast. Even when hiking with Teresa. we got to keep up with each other's pace so that we can walk together. That's why Jesus does this with Peter, James, and John. This is a big point. He lifts us out of the depth. Why? So that we can lift up others. Third thing. I love going to national parks. That's on my bucket list. So like when we do retire, we got to like get out of Dodge for like a year, make ourselves scarce so that the new guy, so I'm not around and being a pain in the rear. Um, so we're going to go away. You know what we're going to do? We're going to visit every national park and every major league baseball stadium. That's on my thing. That should take a year, right? That should be a year. I'll have no money left, but we'll do that. I love going to the national parks. We were just at Glacier, and I love going to Yellowstone. I love inviting our friends around the country. Please visit us. We're like Yellowstone experts. Because over the years, you learn of the places to avoid where the crowds are insane, and you know where the different trails are, and so forth. Because what are the trails like where all the crowds go? We found this in Glacier. Yellowstone's the same way. Tita, they're boardwalks. I'm going, this is not natural. There's boardwalks everywhere. So that even the most out-of-shape person can make their way up the mountain, which is great. I think that's awesome. I really do. But it's pretty fun for us to find those trails that we're hunting down and you're reading reviews and you're looking for spots, stuff like that. But those, when we've never been on those trails, the first time we take them, it's a little sketchy because you don't know how that trail's going to go. And sometimes it's, it's hard. And sometimes you wonder if you're lost. And sometimes you're certain that if it starts to rain now, we're dead, you know, or something. And so, but once you learn those, you begin to expect the journey is going to be uneven. It's not like walking a boardwalk. The journey of faith is uneven. And what I love about this, you know, when we go through the easy parts, because even in hiking up a mountain, isn't it funny how so much of it sometimes feels like you're actually going downhill? There are times where you're kind of in a stretch between a saddle or you're going between a meadow or you're doing something and all of a sudden you got this flat spot and you're, and you're going, oh, this is awesome. This is so great. And then you go, like Bobby, the first time you took me to uh, that, the lake, Ironbog, when you took me up there, he goes, oh yeah, the first quarter of a mile is like, e is like hard and the rest of it's easy. No, it's, up, it's uphill the whole way, dude, the whole way. And the first half a mile is like that. 
and I'm going up, and back, yeah, I go 50 steps, spit my lungs out, put them back in, go again. Yeah, you lied to me. <laughs> but here's the funny part. In the journey that we have, I'm going to encourage us to do something. Do something, because we know the hard parts. Tomorrow's going to be a hard one. There are wonderful times. Don't forget to say thank you. Because too often in those wonderful times where you're walking through the meadow and it's flat and it's sweet and the weather is perfect and it's awesome, we say, oh, that's the time God's blessing me. God's blessing me there. Or we say, oh, I deserve that. I'm so good. Both of those. But don't forget to say thanks for those peaceful, those sweet times, those sweet times where it, it is going easy because God made it possible. God made that possible. But we also don't forget that in the very hardest of times, God has not left us. What one of the things God is teaching us in this journey up and down the mountain on transfiguration is God is there in both joy and in mourning. God is present at the very height of the mountaintop. This is my beloved son whom I love. Listen to him. Now you know. Now you know. But it's also stumbling down the mountain, falling down in the shale field, crawling back up, soaking wet. God is right there. Because you could never have made it through that without him. And so we give thanks to that. God is present in every moment, both joy and in mourning. Last point, last point. So we lived over on the wet side of the mountains for 30 years. You know, Seattle, Oregon, you know, Se um, Seattle Portland, Eugene. And I remember when we moved to Pocatello, loaded up the U-Haul. And we got, you know, you come out of the blues, you come down to Ontario, and you get through Boise. It's really not perfect until you get through on the other side of Boise, and then it's big sky. I love living here, big sky. Because in Oregon, it felt like the trees were all pushing down on me. You could never see the big sky. You had to get to some very rare places like Mount Hood. You had to get to certain places, Mount Rainier, where you could get above it and see. So I love the big sky because it changes my perspective. It changes my perspective when everything is so close and hemmed in and so hard. And a lot of our life is like that too. Isn't it sometimes our life is like this? Stuff is so right here that you cannot see past it. Because it's so urgent, it's so immediate, right in your face. And so the last thing I wanted to say is, God is wanting to change our perspective. For the first one was on Him. God wants us a different perspective of Him. That God is fully human, fully divine, and always with us. I could have stopped preaching right there, couldn't I have? That's enough. But here's another one. God is also wants us to transform our perspective of the valley. Because when you get up to that spot, your eyes are on Jesus. And I think what Jesus is saying is, now turn around. That's what I came to save. I came to save. Because when we're down there, all we can see is, our, we can see so little. And for Jesus to stop and say, that's why I came. That's why I love being a church in this community. That's our privilege. We have an opportunity to be able to say in this valley, Jesus came for you. Just as he has shown his grace and his love to me, so he has shown it to you. It changes our perspective of the valley, but also of what's on the horizon. See, Lent's not in the Bible, but I love that we do it. I love that we do it because it starts with one mountain and concludes with another. We start on the mountain of transfiguration, and it allows us to see Mount Calvary in the distance because that's the destination down the valley with a God and a Savior who suffers and who loves and who continues to walk with us. When we would abandon him, he would never abandon us. And we take that journey to the other mountain and right on through Easter and on into eternity. That's our God. That's our hope. That's why he brings them up to the mountain so they can see the other one and an empty tomb and eternity and rejoice. Let's pray. Gracious Lord, we thank you for your promises and for bringing us up the mountain. We thank you, Lord, um, that you uh, loved us so much that you would honor us in that way. We praise you, and we ask you, Lord, to continue to teach us. Help us to trust in you in good and in hard. But always, Lord, 
to receive your grace. Let it change us, transform us with new eyes to your glory. Amen.